Good. Then I would like to start discussing the intimate connection between the watershed and minimax path and the minimum spanning tree. So what is a minimum spanning tree? If we have some graph, then we're looking for a subgraph. The subgraph should be spanning. That means, well, basically the subgraph encompasses all nodes such that I can walk from one node to any other without leaving this subgraph. It should be spanning and the sum of the edge weights should be as small as possible. It turns out um, that this subgraph will have the shape of a tree. The definition of a tree is that it's a graph with no loops. And this result is called the minimum spanning tree. Um, now, on the bottom here, you see one example. In this particular case, the edges, the edge weights here are loosely reflected by the distance, the Euclidean distance between points in the space, uh, but this need not be so in general. Uh, so we could invent a graph which is not embeddable. For example, we could say that, and let's consider this, we could say we have a distance, a weight or a distance of one here, and a weight or a distance of one there, and a weight or a distance of three down here. And this is something that's not embeddable in Euclidean space, right? So um, the edge weights here can be arbitrary. I consider for now that we have an undirected edge weighted graph. Um, to simplify the discussion, I will also assume that the edge weights here are non negative, um, but that's not really a stringent requirement. And then we can find this minimum spanning tree, and it has several interesting properties. One is this namely, every edge not in the minimum spanning tree. So, for example, let's say um, this edge here, it's not part of the minimum spanning tree, and every edge that's not in the minimum spanning tree should be at least as large as all other edges in the loop induced by adding this edge. So what does that mean? We had the black thing is a tree, a graph with no loops. Now I add this particular edge here, and by adding an edge, I now get out a loop. And I can now look at all the edge weights in this loop, three, one, four, seven, and this one had an edge weight of 10. And it is always true that in this induced loop, the edges, so each edge in this induced loop must have a weight not larger than the one of this extra edge that I have just added. Because if it were so, so for example, if this, if this edge here um, had a weight of 14 and not of four, well, um, then it would have been cheaper to uh, delete this edge and add this edge to my tree. And I would have a better solution. Yeah. But we previously claimed that our minimum spanning tree was minimal, so it had a minimal sum of edge weights. And then um, this property, also called cycle property, always holds. All right. Um, from this, we can derive a fact, namely that if we're looking at any two nodes, let's say this is my node U and this is my node V, then if I'm looking at the minimax path, um, sometimes in case of degeneracy, there can be more than one minimax path between U and V. But one of these uh, minimax path will be part of the minimum spanning tree. So 
Now let's look at uh, various paths here between u and v. Um, well, we could, you know, jump here and then there. This would have a minimax weight of 18, or we could um, go to here 7 and then 5 and 3. Um, this would have a weight of 7, just as this path has. It also has a weight of 7, but as I said, at least one of these will be part of the minimum spanning tree. Now we can turn this around and can say that if for any two nodes u and v, because my tree is spanning, I can always find a path between u and v, no matter which nodes I choose. So if I say u is here and v is there, then I will also find a path along this tree. And uh, this path is always a minimax path. Um, here's another one of these wonderful, you know, 1950s, 1960s paper papers. Uh, it's a letter to the editor, and on page one, the statement is made. Um, the author doesn't really bother to prove it in much detail because it's, you know, all too obvious uh, to him. Um, and then on the well, this is not a one pager this time, uh, but it also discusses the case of directed graphs, which is a bit more complicated. Now I mentioned a little bit this uh, degeneracy here. So if you consider this example here on the right hand side, if I take a union of minimax path, I need not get out a tree necessarily. So I can get a graph with loops. So for example, if I'm looking at um, these two nodes here, well, the minimax, one minimax path would be this one, but another minimax path actually would you know, go around the top node. Um, so here I have a few minimax paths, and if I take these three together, then these will be the three sides of the triangle. So this will be a loopy graph, not a tree, and hence also not a minimum spanning tree. But I could use the minimum spanning tree. Sometimes in case of degeneracy, there's more than one minimum spanning tree. And this one would comprise all the minimax paths. Okay, so this is a, to explain the statement that the union of minimax path is not necessarily the minimum spanning tree, but a minimum spanning tree always gives you all the minimax path between all pairs of nodes. Good, then let's talk about ultrametrics. In an undirected graph, non infatuates, the minimax distances between all pairs of points form an ultrametric. What is that? Uh, you've all seen a metric, and we have a good intuition for what a metric is because you know distances in Euclidean space um, they are metric. So we say that uh, the distance being zero, meaning that uh, two objects are indiscernible, they are not distinguishable. Uh, we require symmetry. The distance from u to v should be the same as distance from v to u. Um, this is the case for most distances, but not for all. So in machine learning, for example, um, you come across the kullback library divergence, and for, for that, for the KL divergence, symmetry does not hold, so it's not a metric. And we need the triangle inequality to hold. Um, so if you remember um, the graph that I showed earlier, so if I say the distance here is 1, 1, and 3, then the triangle, one of the triangle inequalities here is um, violated. Yeah, so those measurements, of whatever these numbers were, they could not be a metric. Um, now, in an ultrametric, these properties hold plus an extra one, 
Um, this one is a tightening of the triangle inequality. It's stronger than the triangle inequality. It's called the ultrametric inequality. Namely, um, the distance between u and v uh, must be less than or equal, not the sum of the other two distances, but uh, must be less than or equal the maximum of the other two distances, yeah, where I've introduced uh, a distance to an auxiliary node w. Um, this statement here implies that if I look at all um, three inequalities, um, I will find at least one which says that dij is less than dik, and dik is the same as dkj. That means, geometrically speaking, that uh, we are always looking at uh, triangles with two identical sides. Um, these are also called isosceles triangles, and hence this is ultrametric space is sometimes called an isosceles space. And why do we care? Um, because whenever uh, we have an ultrametric, uh, that means we can find a nice hierarchical description of such data. So a set of points with ultrametric distances between them, they can be represented as leaves in an ultrametric tree. An ultrametric tree is one in which all leaves have the same distance from the root. So for example, I've been on the right hand side here, I've been constructing um, this one. So um, let's look at this minimum spanning tree. Let's sort the edges. Um, the first one, the lowest weight, okay, to get something like the tree on the right hand side, I think I started like this. Um, so merging these or the cost of going from one to the other, that's a cost of one. And hence, I put this branching point at a height of 1. Then these two, excuse me, um, then somewhere else, these here are merged. And we have a bit of degeneracy here in the sense that um, they all get merged in the sense of minimax at the same time. And that's at a cost of two. Then we merge these with a third node at a cost of three. And also here, we merge with a third node at a cost of three. And it goes on like this. We have one extra node coming in at a cost of four and one node in coming in at the cost of seven. And then these two merge, and this one also comes in at the cost of eight. And you see by my lines here that you know, I've drawn something nested, uh, so I have a strict hierarchy here in my observations. And these I can always represent by means of such an ultrametric tree. Um, now, one nice thing about such an ultrametric tree is that after suitable pre-processing, if I want to find out what's the distance between any two nodes, for example, what's the minimax distance between these two, well, then I have uh, to walk up, and I have to walk up until I find the least common ancestor, which would be this one, and then I can read off the height of this least common ancestor. 
and by use of clever data structures, turns out that you will be able to do this in constant time. So not even logarithmic, uh, you know, walking up the tree or something, um, but really in, in constant time. Very nice. Good. So um, here I have outlined the connection between minimax paths and the minimum spanning tree. Let me know if you have any questions.